The reading today is on page 1105. It's Acts chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. 1105. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying in a trance, I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord, nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered into the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his home and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as it had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objection and praised God, saying, So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. This is the word of the Lord. Father, as we prayed, so we ask now that you help us live. Help us live as those in your real presence to whom you really speak, those whom you commission and call to be your people in your world. Father, help us live out that prayer we've just sung and might your Holy Spirit empower us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Do please sit down and it would help both you and me if you'd turn back to page 1,103, 1,103. We're continuing in the acts of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the act is about the progress of the word of God. Yes, the act is about the work of the apostles. Yes, the act is uh, full of dependence on the Holy Spirit. But primarily, this is the acts of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who through his Holy Spirit, through his gospel, through his apostles, continues to work. And right as we start with that first reading that Fraser read for us, we get to ask a very difficult question, don't we? If the risen Lord Jesus can heal, and it seems from this historical account that he can, well, why doesn't he today? Some of us, of course, ask the question, why doesn't he heal me? And some ask the question, why doesn't he heal them? So does God heal today? Could he? Or can he? 
The temptation for most of us at this point is to look, first of all, to our experience. So someone might say, yes, of course God can heal today, and I've seen it. Or some might say, no, God doesn't heal today, because I've never seen it. But we're evangelical folk, aren't we? So our own experience is not the primary decision maker, is it? I've never seen, personally, an African Ethiopian become a Christian. But has it happened? Of course it's happened. So we can't come at healing just by saying what I have seen or haven't seen. Indeed, even science makes this mistake. If you ever read any scientific engagement with the concept of miracle, they all fall down on the same issue. It goes back to a famous um, piece of writing by Hume, one of the great philosophers. Hume's argument is, uh, because it has never happened, it can never happen. A miracle has never happened, he argues, so a miracle can never happen. That depends, of course, on infinite knowledge, doesn't it? You have to know every single thing that's ever happened in the whole of the universe to say that a miracle's never happened. That's Hume claiming a nod of knowledge, isn't it? But, you know, the, the argument could go like this. In the last 300 years, the UK hasn't executed a monarch. Therefore, we never have. But if you'd studied a bit more history, you might have heard of Charles I. And you might have known that in 1649, we did. Do you see? So to claim a miracle's never happened, because they've never happened, is to claim you know everything. Now, if that is your view, do shake my hand afterwards. I've got a lot of questions I'd like to ask you. What we're going to see, I think, as we look through the text, is a deeper thing that's going on. My personal view, formed by Scripture, is that God can and does heal today, but that he doesn't promise to heal. He does not promise physical healing now. And that means that if you and I pray for someone to be healed and they're not healed, it's no lack of faith on our part, and it's no lack of love on his part. There's something deeper going on. We're going to see that this morning. And of course, as ever, if this is a personal and difficult issue for you, pick up the phone. I'd love to come and drink a cup of coffee with you sometime this week, and I'd be really happy to talk further about this, because this is personal for some of us. I think the focus of Acts chapters 9, 10, and 11 is we see today that God can heal, although he doesn't always. But we also see the bigger thing that God's about in this world. God can heal, though he doesn't always. But we're going to see very clearly the bigger thing that God's about in his world. That section in chapter 9, I think, tells us this. The risen Jesus saves many. We're back with Peter, aren't we? Verse 32. Do you remember Peter, the leader of the 12? You've got the 12 apostles. You've got the three, Peter, James, and John. And then you've got Peter, who's the leader of them. Peter, on this rock I'll build my, ch- on this rock I'll build my church. Peter, who gives the great evangelistic sermon in chapter 2 of Acts, that Pentecost sermon. Peter, who's already preached, I think, four times in the book of Acts so far. The leader of the church in Jerusalem and a key player in the acts of the risen Jesus. And here's Peter traveling around the country, verse 32, and he's visiting the Lord's people who live in Lydda. And he finds Aeneas, who's been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. The question is, can Peter do traveling around the country in the name of the risen Jesus what Peter's already done in Jerusalem in the name of the risen Jesus? Peter's already healed, hasn't he, in Jerusalem? We've got to remember it right there, haven't we? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And if you went to Sunday school, you'll know that he went walking and leaping and praising God. Acts chapters 3 and 4. Peter can heal in Jesus' name in Jerusalem, but is that blessing reserved for Jerusalem? No. So Luke presents this seriously sick person. Can the risen Lord Jesus heal him through Peter? Yes, he can. Get up, verse 34. Roll up your mat. And immediately Aeneas got up. Just as in Jesus' miracles, they were almost always immediate. And the one time they they weren't. It was for a particular reason. So the risen Lord Jesus, healing through Peter, immediately heals. And what happens? Verse 35. 
all those who lived there and saw it turned to the Lord. The healing's about something bigger. Because the healing enables salvation for very many. So can Jesus heal the serious sick person? Of course he can. Well, let's try something harder then. Let's keep Peter moving on, verse 36, and let's go to Joppa. He can heal a sick person. Can he raise a dead person? Can this risen Jesus do resurrection? Through Peter. Yes, he can. About that time, she became ill and died, and her body was washed. Remember, this is Dr. Luke writing. Okay? This is a doctor who says she's dead. We can't just say she took a very deep breath and slowed her pulse rate down, can we, in these pre-scientific days? No, the doctor thought she was dead. She was dead. And she's been washed, and she's been left in an upstairs room. And Peter's not even there at the time, but they call him, verse 38. Lydda was near Joppa, so they heard that Peter's in Lydda. They send two men to him, and they urge him, please come at once. And he comes, and she's raised from the dead. And what's the result of this, verse 42? It becomes known all over Joppa, and many believe in the Lord. That's to say, the risen Lord Jesus is still at work, still doing on earth through Peter what he did on earth himself and we see throughout the gospels which is compassionately healing so that the gospel is clearly endorsed and so that men and women boys and girls can turn and be saved always always those healings are pointing to who Jesus is God's only chosen king they're part of all that Jesus did on earth, where you look at it and say, only God could do that. And that's precisely what you're meant to say. Now, of course, the healings reveal God's character. They reveal his love and his compassion. Of course they do that. But more than that, they point to who Jesus is. And that's why the reaction here in verse 35 and verse 42 is not that they built a statue to Peter but that they worship the Lord. And therefore, many eternal people were won from hell for heaven through these healings. The risen Lord Jesus is still at work. He's still doing and teaching through his apostles, according to the Bible, by his Holy Spirit. What's striking here is that Aeneas has been bedridden for eight years. Do you wonder if anybody had prayed for him for eight years? Well, of course they had. Surely he must have been prayed for for eight years. So does God always heal? Well, he hadn't for eight years, had he? All those prayers for healing, he hadn't healed. So when you and I come across situations where we pray and pray and pray, and God doesn't heal, that fits in very clearly with the Bible's teaching, doesn't it? Eight years he hadn't healed. And in this case, he did heal. Do you think they'd ever prayed for Tabitha or Dorcas? Of course they had. And for years and years, as she'd got more and more ill, they'd prayed. And God didn't answer yes. And then he does. Interestingly, the Bible doesn't set up an expectation that every time we pray for healing, it'll happen. So you and I shouldn't be surprised. And there are some people on this planet who, whose healing I've been praying for for 25 years. God's heard every one of those prayers. And I shouldn't be thrown by that, should I? Keep on praying those prayers. They're good prayers to pray. The risen Lord Jesus is at work. Interestingly, as we go on in the book of Acts, we'll see that Peter, at one point, is released from jail, and James isn't, and gets executed. So prayer is not putting money into a slot machine, is it? Imagine that all the disciples have the gift of healing. Then we'd still have disciples around today, wouldn't we? Because as long as two st stuck together, whenever the first one died, the other one would simply raise them back to life again. So as long as they went around the world in pairs, they'd, they'd be around 2,000 years old today, wouldn't they? But that wasn't God's plan. Unless they died in the same chariot crash or something, but I don't think chariots went at quite the same pace as some of the lorries you and I try and avoid on the M6. As long as they'd got around in pairs, we'd still have them today. That wasn't God's plan, was it? But gloriously, the risen Lord Jesus proves who he is, demonstrates his compassion by healing. And so the risen Lord Jesus saves many through these healings. You might sit there thinking, okay, uh, the risen Lord Jesus saves many, but what sort of folk does he save? 
We look at the church in the UK today and we think the church is pretty white, uh, pretty middle class, and possibly slightly older than average. Does Jesus just save those sorts of people? There was an induction service in this uh, deanery uh, on Monday night and sat in the front row uh, was a nine-year-old goth. And she had the time of her life. The studded dog collar. There are lots of people wearing dog collars in the service, of course. Bishops and people, archdeacons, you know. Uh, there was this girl with a dog collar, dark black, with all these silver studs coming out of it. She absolutely loved the service. And she loved the message. The Jesus we meet in the Bible is calling anybody and everybody, isn't he? One of the things we pray for our churches. More diversity of every sort would be brilliant, wouldn't it? Because remember, in eternity, it's an uncountable multitude of every tribe, tongue, nation, and race. I guess you and I one day will sing the praise of Jesus accompanied by a didgeridoo trio. That is not my type of music. I have no didgeridoo trio CDs in my house. But one day, it'll be that glorious diversity. We're all singing to the same Jesus. And the church on earth would be great if we looked a bit more like that sometimes. The risen Lord Jesus saves many, and then in chapter 11, he calls all. The risen Lord Jesus saves many, and he calls all. Chapter 11, the apostles and believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So Peter went up to Jerusalem. The circumcised believers, that is the Jews, criticized him and said, you went into the house of an uncircumcised person, and you ate with them. Now, this story is told three times, twice in chapter 10. Do take the opportunity this afternoon. Put the kettle on. Sit down and read chapter 10. It's a brilliant chapter. Do have a read. It's a real treat. The story is told three times in chapter 10, twice in chapter 10, once here, and the vision is seen three times. This is really, really important, isn't it? Because this is God saying very, very clearly to his Jewish people that this message is for all. This message is for the Gentiles too. And here we have in chapter 11 the summary, verse 4. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story, which again I can encourage you to read from chapter 10. There he was, verse 5, in Joppa. He's praying and he sees a vision and in the vision the sheet comes down. And he looks, verse 6, and inside the sheet are all these four-footed animals, wild animals, that Jews, according to the Old Testament, could not eat. And he hears a voice, and the voice says, get up, kill, and eat. Now, you know Peter, don't you? Peter's very good at telling God what to do. He's got history on that, hasn't he? When uh, Jesus says in Mark chapter 8, I'm, you're right, I'm the Christ. It's necessary that I must suffer. Peter says, no, 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 no. Do you remember, get behind me, Satan, is his rebuke. John chapter 13, where Jesus explains that he's going to the cross. And Peter says, don't worry, Jesus, I'll stick with you. Everybody else will betray you, but I won't betray you. Peter's got history, hasn't he? He still hasn't quite learned. Verse 9, Peter is still arguing with God. In my experience, that never goes well. Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice speaks a second time. Do not call anything impure that God's made clean. And it happens three times. Do you see the big point here? The big point here is that what applies to food, that nothing's impure, now applies to people. No one is impure. So the Jews had their Jewish food, and they weren't to eat Gentile food. And God says, what applies to food, get up, kill, and eat, applies to the people too. They're not impure anymore. So that in chapter 10, when you read it, you'll see that Peter, uh, as he... As he speaks goes on a journey verse 15 do not call anything impure that god has made clean in chapter 10 by verse 34 here's what peter says i now realize it is true that god does not show favoritism the jews are not god's favorites god loves and calls all now the wrong application of this is to say oh brilliant well, it's great, isn't it? Everybody's going to be saved. Everybody will get to heaven somehow, so we can relax. Now, that wouldn't be the right application, would it? As you read Jesus' own words in the Gospels throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
Jesus is lovingly clear about the existence of hell. Jesus even weeps over those who turn away from him because he knows what their eternal destiny is. So we can't say this suddenly means everybody will be saved. But what it does mean is that everybody is called. Anyone from anywhere can be saved. And since the majority of us here are not Jews, but are Gentiles, I take it this passage is very, very exciting for you and I. Because without this, you and I wouldn't be saved. We wouldn't call God Father, and we wouldn't have hope of a glorious future. So the story goes on. Right then, these men appear. They've been called by an angel. They get to the house. And what happens? Verse 14 of chapter 11. Peter is going to bring a message through which the whole household will be saved. And again, as you go back and read chapter 10, you'll recognize the message. It's going to a Gentile audience, but it's the same message Peter has preached in his other four sermons so far in the book of Acts. Now, it's not precisely the same, because remember, Peter says to the Jews, you killed him. But he can't say that to the Gentiles. He just says to the Gentiles, they killed him. But apart from that, the principle of the gospel message in chapter 10 is exactly the same as it always has been. What is the gospel? Jesus was killed, God raised him, and he was seen by many people. The Jewish leaders killed him, God raised him, and people saw him. And that means forgiveness from that eternal judgment is possible simply by trusting Jesus. And when you do that, you'll be given the Holy Spirit. And that's how we know that the gospel is for Gentiles too, verse 15. Because Peter says, as I began to preach... By the way, you'll notice when you read chapter 10, Jesus doesn't explain to them anything about the Holy Spirit. He doesn't promise them the Holy Spirit. He actually leaves out any reference to the Holy Spirit. He just preaches the gospel. And God, in cosmic approval of the gospel faithfully preached, pours his Holy Spirit out on those Gentiles. That is God saying, yes, isn't it? Peter doesn't even explain about him. But God fills them with the Spirit as a divine approval to demonstrate that the gospel is for Gentiles too. So verse 17 of chapter 11, if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to think I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then, even to Gentiles, God has given repentance that leads to life. As they respond to the message, they're given the Holy Spirit, which is God's divine approval of the gospel going out to all. So here we have a great reminder of the book of Acts. Jesus says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. The gospel is to go out to everyone and anyone. Now, you and I as normal Christians, we find this terrifying, don't we? Most of us are familiar with hearing biblical calls to mission and evangelism. And we respond with two things, don't we? We normally respond with fear. And we normally respond with disobedience to our king. That's our habit, isn't it? When we hear these calls. But here in chapter 9, 10, 11, we get a lovely picture of the risen Lord Jesus who compassionately heals so that many can be saved and who gloriously calls all men and women Jew and Gentile old and young rich and poor you name a distinction that exists humanly and God calls everybody across it that's why we chose to think about those two people Jesus met this morning You name a distinction, and God calls everybody across it. How does God reach those people? Through normal people, terrified, and yet obedient Christians like you and me. Let's pray together. Father, please fill our hearts with the glory and the joy of your desire to reach anybody and everybody with the message of Jesus. And please teach us, our Lord, full obedience. You know that we're fearful. 
but we long to obey. Father, we dare to pray even now. Give us each this week one good conversation with someone who doesn't yet know Jesus. Help us speak his name and offer his love and salvation. We pray in Jesus' own powerful name. Amen. Our next song reminds us of Jesus' sacrifice of perfect love on the cross to save all those who were called and turned to him. On the screen and mission praise number 755, when I survey the wondrous cross. Please stand and sing. Please sit for a final prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you sent your Son, love amazing, so divine, to save all those that turn to him, regardless of where they're from or their background. Everyone may have that profound joy of, re of receiving God's saving power through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray that those who don't yet believe may hear the gospel message and become believers through the power of the Holy Spirit and that Christians may continue to know the transforming power of Jesus Christ and become ever more like him. Be with us, Lord, in this coming week. Guide us in all that we do and let it all be for your glory. Help people see your will for us shine through our lives. And we pray this in our Lord and Saviour's name. Amen.